FNAF has a funny history with voice acting. The first few games featured none of it aside from that of Scott Cawthon and some stock audio. Proper voice actors didn't feature in the series until FNAF World. Some may like to forget this game even existed, but its impact on what FNAF would become is undeniable. As of now, across the entire FNAF series, the number of speaking roles is... 87?! If you choose to count the two technicians as separate roles in the anime cutscene voiceover as one role and the hand unit variants as one role, I mean, you kind of really have to stretch to get to that number, but- WHAT?! These performances are all great, and if I could, I would gush over all of them right now. Believe me, I've tried to work praising every single role in this series into a video, but it just did not work. It would have been an hour long. In this video, I will mainly be talking about the evolution of voice acting through the Click Team era of FNAF. Real quick, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for getting this channel to 1,000 subscribers. I never would have imagined that many people enjoying something that I made. Genuinely, thank you all. So, what better way to start than with Phone Guy? Hello? Hello, hello? Played by Scott Cawthon, this entire character immediately demonstrates the limitations that Scott faced making these games by himself. That being that, he had to be the voice of any characters with an audible speaking role in the first few games. Any animatronics with voices in these games were all provided by stock sound effects. This includes the laughter heard from Freddy and Golden Freddy, and Foxy's humming in FNAF 1. And in FNAF 3, Springtrap's moaning is actually just distorted audio of an alpaca. I personally thought some of these were at least recorded by Scott's family or something, but once Balloon Boy's <laughs> laugh showed up in a Coco Melon video, that kind of ruined the immersion for me coming back to the original games. What do you say we go for a drive? <laughs> the YouTuber Toasted Cherries has a good video which goes over the origins of some of these sound effects. Consider checking it out. Scott's profession is in game development, not voice acting, so this could have potentially been the reason that Phone Guy was brought back so many times in early FNAF, because it may have been somewhat immersion breaking to hear multiple different characters all clearly with Scott's voice. Blah blah blah. Now that might sound bad, I know, but. Fazbear Entertainment is committed to family fun and above all, accidents, slash injuries, slash death. Perhaps this was why Phone Dude had such a small role in FNAF 3. Hey, hey, glad you came back for another night. In my opinion though, Scott did a good job putting on a different voice for this character. I completely bought into his joke that he just got some random guy outside his house to voice him. Throughout FNAF 4, laughter can be heard from the Nightmare Fredbear variants, and also in the background of the intermissionary minigames. <laughs> From what I've been able to find, these are the only voices in the original saga, aside from the phone guides, that were not provided by stock assets online, and I believe these are in fact the voice of one of Scott's children. Though I have not found any definitively reliable source to prove this, these sound effects cannot be found on any online sound library. They are slowed and pitched down from their original state to make them sound more monstrous, but also in such a way that I've seen many people saying these laughs almost sound like crying at times, which I think works well for the story of this game particularly with the older brother's bullying of the crying child, and his eventual regret and remorse over his actions. Scott has said that voice acting was the natural progression of Five Nights at Freddy's after making the first four main games, that it was a way of improving upon and adding new ideas to the formula. I'm sure he had the budget for it after the success of the first game, but he considers making the first four games to all be one continuous session. Sister Location and FNAF World were the first games that felt new, to Scott at least, and thus, it only made sense that they introduced new elements. Is that maybe why you decided to put voice acting in, um, to change things up a little bit? I think I think for Five Nights at Freddy's one through four, I consider that all like one one sitting for me. Like I, I sat down, I feel like I just sat down and made all four games in one sitting. Yeah. And it was only after that that I sat back and thought, hmm, you know, how can I improve upon this? How can I add something new? And so that's when I was, you know, entertaining new ideas in my mind. Yeah. And yeah, voice acting just just kind of. I don't remember exactly what it was, but man, I'm sure glad that I did. You know, I bumped into just some incredible talent. A lot of the voice actors Scott has hired have previously done work in voiceover, particularly for commercials, PSAs, audiobooks, that kind of thing. When Scott first started hiring voice actors, it was primarily through Voices.com, a website through which voice talent can find work and companies can put up jobs that said voice talent can apply for. And on top of the teasers that would be uploaded on scottgames.com, these jobs paved the way for speculation leading up to the release of a new FNAF game in a completely new way. Especially back when it was possible to see the names of these roles on the reviews for them, every time a new actor appeared under Scott Cawthon's profile, 
discussion would spark immediately. On a website, I believe, called Voices.com, there has been a lot of comments from the people Scott's working with in regards to the voiceover work that they've been doing. And they've actually revealed quite a lot to do with the story. And this one seems to be a lot more story driven than all of the other Five Nights at Freddy's games. So we're going to be discussing what this could mean for the franchise. So let's get straight into this. Scott almost didn't even need to make teasers for these games when names for roles like Little Girl Wants to Play, Men at Work, Villain, and Vampire were already enough to get people talking. In fact, Scott even used this information being publicly available to his advantage during the wait for sister location. Uploading a teaser following voice clips for the character Ballora prematurely being dug up on Voices.com. But thank you to Michael who posted this on Reddit and Sonic Yay for finding the clip of one of the voice actors singing some songs. Which simply said, cancelled due to leaks. At least that's how it first appeared. But this is a Scott Cawthon teaser. Of course there's more to it than just what you can immediately see. Brightening up the image reveals the teaser was not actually talking about the leaks, though that is of course how it was meant to come across, but was instead some nice lore bits and clues to the story for Sister Location. This teaser wrote off the popularity of these quote-unquote leaks for the voice acting in the upcoming game, and though this kind of thing wasn't done again to my knowledge, it was incredibly clever of Scott, and might have incited more of this kind of digging from the fanbase, to find hints about the contents of the next game whenever they appeared. Sister Location may have been the game that featured voice acting most prominently, and used it most to its advantage in its storytelling as well as gameplay, but it was not the FNAF game where professional voice actors were first made use of. That honour would go to FNAF World. This game took a more cartoony approach to the characters of the franchise, and the same goes for the voices they were given in Update 2. A lot of voices from this game may not seem like they fit the characters they're intended for, because for a lot of them that was kind of the point. They were more so meant to embody archetypes than capture the essence of a specific character in many cases. Foxy Fighters was a parody of Star Fox, Sheikah's Magic Rainbow emulated classic rage games, and Foxy.exe was pretty on the nose with what it was parodying. FNAF World used voice acting mainly for the sake of humour, seen particularly in the Chica's Magic Rainbow minigame, where there's literally a whole gag that you can't disable the voice of the rainbow, no matter how annoying she gets. Oh really? It's like that! Voices off, you say? Well now you really p*** me off! Some of the actors that featured in this game would later come back, a few even becoming staples of the series including Chris McCullough, who voiced Fredbear. Holy crap, is that my voice? Jesse Adam, who voiced Foxy. This will be your last cameo. Amber Lee Connors, the voice of Toy Chica. Bingo! Got him! Nightmare Chica. Sorry I'm late to the party. And JJ. Now I'm going to kick your ass! And PJ Haywood, who voiced Soldozer. How dare you challenge me! All of these actors would go on to play a number of different roles later in the series. For some reason, there were also a couple of pretty notable names in the voiceover scene that appeared in this game. Specifically, Debbie Derryberry, who played Chica's Magic Rainbow. Wow, what a moron! And Mark Martell, who played Foxy.exe. Derryberry is a voice actor who's been in a number of popular franchises, and Martell has made a name for himself in the music production industry. FNAF World also introduced Heather Masters as Baby, albeit with a slightly more robotic performance from the one she provides in Sister Location. Everyone, please stay in your seats. Jumping into Sister Location, you're immediately given a sense of just how different this game is going to be from the ones that came before it. The voices are practically thrown in your face straight from the beginning. Hell, before the beginning. The actual game hasn't even started by the time you hear the first words of spoken dialogue. There are just certain design choices this dialogue in question was actually intended to be used for a trailer for Sister Location, hence why the official trailer on Scott's YouTube channel is titled Trailer 1. The second trailer was just scrapped and turned into this opening sequence that you see in the final game. Once the game does start, dialogue is just as prevalent. Yeah, there's a lot of talking in Sister Location, to the point that many people thought the game held your hand a bit too much. Some people think it's just a glorified do-what-you're-told simulator. Please enter your name. Now open the elevator. View the window to your left. Press the blue button. Go forward. Stop. Die. Which I think comes from the fact that this game was a bit more story-driven than the previous entries. The prominence of voice acting in Sister Location really set it apart from the games that came before it. Characters are constantly speaking to you, giving you instructions, providing exposition, dodging child support. The baby isn't mine! Voice acting was also used for ambience on occasion, very faintly in the background. Some garbled speech from the game's characters can be made out, on top of the creepy as hell sound effects that already add a lot to this game's atmosphere on their own. Five, one, eight. 
The companions who follow you throughout this location, filling in the silence even if not in the most encouraging way, make the scary moments in this game even more effective when they leave you alone with nothing but the sound of the quiet, mysterious ambience that you can never quite tell where it's coming from. Very clever sound design. System restart. The cast for Sister Location is massive, so let's break it into pieces. Consider this the main robo cast of characters. There's Andy Field, who plays Hand Unit. Exotic Butters. Julie Shields, who plays the computer voice. Access denied. Heather Masters, who plays Circus Baby. Why didn't you trust me? Michelle Moss, who plays Ballora. Save me a dance for another day, perhaps. Becky Shrimpton, who plays Bonbon. Bon. You must be hearing things, silly. <laughs> and Kellen Goff, who plays Funtime Freddy. I know you're over there somewhere! Hand Unit's voice was meant to be friendly and reassuring for the player, and Scott apparently wanted the character to invoke HAL 9000 from the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Bishop takes queen, knight takes bishop. Thank you for a very enjoyable game. I see what you were trying to type, and I will auto-correct it for you. One moment. Welcome, Eggs Benedict. Scott said, robot voice, um... Something like HAL 2000, which is a famous robot voice. What he said was, uh, you are the only friendly voice ah, in, okay. this in this horror game. The computer voice is where you can start to see Scott experimenting with voice acting, having a little fun with it. Because this character doesn't really serve much purpose to the game, she's really only there to add some flavor to the presentation. Motion trigger, circus gallery vent. I personally think she's underutilized and could have really made for some more scary moments like this part in Night 2. Motion trigger, entryway vent. Funtime Auditorium maintenance vent opened. Ballora Gallery maintenance vent opened. But she definitely makes the game feel less empty, and her inclusion is still very much appreciated. Heather Masters took inspiration from the childlike Empress from the never-ending story when constructing Baby's voice, trying to make the character sound more sympathetic. Fantasia can arise in you, from your dreams and wishes, Bastion. There is something bad inside of me. I'm broken. I can't be fixed. I would say that my biggest inspiration that I drew from was my childhood dream, the Empress from The NeverEnding Story. You know, she's very, okay. very, like, quit, like, tortured, and the way that she speaks is kind of peculiar. Michelle and Moss actually wrote the song that Ballora sings. Um, actually, in my case, it was having to write a song. And I think one of the reasons I got the audition in the first place was that in my bio, I have that I'm a songwriter and he needed a song written for that particular character. So when I got the audition, I wrote the song on the spot and uh, with the lines he provided. And that's probably what helped me get the gig and the full track isn't even heard in game. Let alone without the volume turned all the way down and made super echoey and overlaid on top of a completely different song which doesn't match the rhythm of this one. It's a good song though, really creepy. Funtime Freddy was specified by Scott to sound like a costumed entertainer that kids would love but adults would be unsettled by, which was apparently part of the reason Kellen Goff tried to give the character a German accent. <laughs> because he was inspired by existing characters with German accents that fit that description. He specifically cited Medic from Team Fortress 2 as an example. When the patient woke up, his skeleton was missing, and the doctor was never heard from again! They said unsettling for adults, but kids love him, so that's what I thought of at the time. I just want to publicly apologize if you were offended at that. I never meant to say that the German way of speaking was creepy for all of them, just that there have been depictions of very creepy Germans that I took from, like, the medic from TF2. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and, uh, 
I can't think of another one. And Medic from TF2 might have been the inspiration for German Freddy. Did you also know Goff originally auditioned to play William Afton? So this is your audition for William? Yeah, this okay. is my audition for William. All right, William. let's do it. <laughs> I feel there are elements of this design that perhaps you don't fully understand. I thought that was cool. The more minor roles include John Matthew as the board member in the opening cutscene, the first voice you actually hear in this game. Those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Afton. Jesse Adam as the angsty teen voice for Hand Unit. Let's start with your nightly chores. Jason Kappos as the two technicians. Are those really the only pictures we have of these guys? What happened to it this time? Some kind of hardware malfunction. Zeho Jane Nakvi as the Biddy Babs. I don't want to play hide and seek. Chris McCullough as Vlad. I may be undead, but you're heartless. Amberly Connors as Clara. Vlad, you suck. And Bob Barnes as the narrator for The Immortal and the Restless. Oh, the humanity! Who I just found out was apparently supposed to return for Help Wanted. Now I'm sad. And then there's the Aftons. Yes, I split them into their own category. PJ Hayward as William and Michael Afton. She can dance. She can sing. I've been living in shadows. And Zehra Jane Nakvi as Elizabeth Afton. I'm still here. I've already talked at length about the Afton's British accents in the past, so instead I'll say that Hayward was influenced by Hannibal Lecter for the voice he gave William, based on Scott's direction of wanting the character to sound like a snake oil salesman. And don't your eyes seek out the things you want? Why did you leave that ranch? The original audition said that he was looking for someone who sounded like a snake oil salesman. And to me, that, you know, put me in mind of Hannibal Lecter. And one of the, the uh, characteristics mm -hmm. of the character was that he was perfectly calm no matter what he was doing, even if he was uh, during someone at the time. Hayward put this together to make William sound calm and collected, even a little confident in the short amount of time he gets to speak in sister location. She can take song requests. She can even dispense ice cream. That conniving voice is one you just immediately do not trust. Michael's voice was basically just a matter of making him sound different enough to William and younger than him that they were obviously different characters, but still close enough that you could tell they're related. I think my main concern with that was to try and make them sufficiently different. It wasn't so much about who they are, it was more about making sure that people didn't go, well, that just sounds like William doing something strange to his voice, you know? <laughs> it, it has to be something that, that uh, obviously, familial resemblance in the voice. Michael's monologue was slightly altered by Scott towards the end, as he wanted to make it sound more dramatic by slowing it down, but inadvertently ended up making Michael sound robotic and throwing a real wrench in the lore discussion at the time. I'm going to come find you. I'm going to come find you. Scott's reasoning for this was that he was afraid of asking PJ for another take, because the rest of this one was too good not to use. Elizabeth is heard throughout sister location between each night, her story is told to us in pieces, and even though Nakvi is basically performing alone to herself, her lines and their delivery paint a vivid image in the head of their listener, and it makes it all the more impactful once you figure out where it's all going. Where do the other children go? Sorry about that, I just really wanted to talk about the Aftons and their vocal performances. There's a theme in Sister Location of things acting human or possessing human traits while not being human, or even necessarily being alive. And I think it's a sort of development on that uncanny valley feeling that elevated FNAF to its status in the horror game scene in the first place. A plastic face should not smile like it has emotions, a machine should not talk like it's your friend, and a dead man should not walk if his skeleton has been removed. Sister Location may have gotten Scott in trouble for leaning too far in a sci-fi direction, but its aesthetic and its central themes were still played with in a way that was the definition of horror. And you know the voices in this game played a part in that, because it brought more life to this place and to these things that should very much be devoid of life. It really does feel like this was the natural evolution for communicating horror in FNAF. Starting in Sister Location and continuing into Pizzeria Simulator, the way that voice acting was incorporated into the games was pretty unorthodox. Either Scott hadn't yet figured out how to use it in a way that felt natural, or this was just his style and we had to get used to it. Because many Let's Players going into this game would be spouting theories and banter and whatnot, and then quickly shut up because an echoey, disembodied voice suddenly started speaking to them, and they didn't know what to make of it. So, uh, I want to thank Scott for uh, giving me early access Daddy, to the- why won't you let me play with her?
Did you hear words Welcome there? Welcome to the first day of your exciting- Of course, whenever a character speaks in Click Team FNAF games, they're never on screen. And when they are, there's never any indication that they're talking or going to talk. The reaction from anyone who heard Elizabeth's voice in Night 1 for the first time was usually either, What? Or, Did you guys hear that? Partly because this was a new element to these games, but also because this was a strange way to use voice acting in a game. Sister Location opens with a conversation from characters who never appear again, completely unexpectedly, and then in Pizzeria Simulator, whenever you're killed by an animatronic, they berate you with a death quote. That was easier than I thought it would be. You could never really predict when a character was going to say something. Pizzeria Simulator mostly featured returning roles, but it made up for this by making its one new role one of the most important and impactful in the series, and also by squeezing voice acting into every part of this game as possible, particularly through the multiple endings and in the gameplay. First, during nights where animatronics are loose in the building, you can hear them speak sometimes when they get close to your office. Where are you? Shut up, bitch. And, most memorably, whenever they kill you. During the endings, you would either be congratulated or chastised depending on your performance during your playthrough, which was a fun way of adding to the game's humor and especially to the lore. Needless to say, you're fired. Pizzeria Sim's cast consisted of Andy Field as hand unit, sorry, tutorial unit. Now do everyone a favor and get lost. Heather Masters as Scrap Baby. Did I catch you off guard? Kellen Goff as Molten Freddy. Oh, what a pleasant surprise! PJ Hayward as William Afton. What a deceptive calling. And Dave Steele as Cassette Man. Are they still aware? I hope not. The voice for Lefty's shushes are currently unknown. While Field admits there isn't much difference between hand unit and tutorial unit performance-wise, he has had more fun voicing tutorial unit due to the character having more comical lines. I'm having a little more fun with tutorial unit lately mm. because the lines are all... I, I still don't... You know, I had a good bit of hand unit's lines memorized, but tutorial, he's a whole new guy, and I'm having to... Well, he's not a whole new guy. It's the same character, really, but mm -hmm. but the lines are all new, and so uh, I think tutorial unit kind of rags on the player a little more. Yes, and so, yeah. And so it's a little more fun to interact with people and use those lines, I mm -hmm. think. Kellen Goff seemed to go a little more manic and unhinged with Molten Freddy compared to Funtime Freddy, especially with the character's laughter. <laughs> and given that he was the one who edited together Freddy's glitchy voice the first time around, the character's speaker sounding even more broken can probably also be attributed to Kellen. Knock, knock. I'm here. Oh, he wanted the effects with the audition. That's the other thing. Oh wait, I, you had to do your own audio effects? Yeah, no, wow. I, I, I'm an audio engineer. I made, I made my own effects for it. That was my favorite yeah. part though, like well stu done. stuttering up, <laughs> stuttering up the audio and putting the, putting the effect on it was my favorite part of the whole thing. The most noticeable difference between Afton's voice in this game compared to Sister Location is his more raspy, growly voice. You may not recognize me at first, but I assure you, that's still me. And his snake-like way of talking, where he drags out his How S's. I resist a promise such as which I think goes to show how much Afton has lost his humanity with how monstrous and slimy he now sounds. Cassette Man, or Henry, was meant to initially not leave much of an impact on the player, to be a monotonous yet firm-voiced supervisor with little enthusiasm. Despite that, while Steele keeps Henry mostly lethargic and stern, there are moments with subtle hints of emotion, grief and regret especially. Small souls trapped in prisons of my making, now set to new purpose and used in ways I never thought imaginable. And the endings involving monologues from Henry have become one of the most iconic moments not only in FNAF, but in the history of video game endings as a whole. And I doubt it would have been that way if not for Steele's acting. It's time to rest for you and for those you have carried in your arms. This ends for all of us in communication. It's worth mentioning that the voices for the animatronics finally allowed these characters to have personalities that could be shown off in the games. And while this also applies to Sister Location, Pizzeria Simulator put more of a focus on these voices by making them a part of the gameplay as well as the moments dedicated to the story. These animatronics were doing the same things we've seen them do in the previous games, roam around the pizzeria trying to get into your office, but this time they spoke as they did so. It's so much easier to interpret personalities for these characters now and have them be more than just animatronic husks that are programmed to come after you. Really, what set apart Bonnie, Chica, and Freddy in the first game? Their movement patterns, that's it. 
But now what sets FNAF animatronics apart is their choice of words that they whisper at you from down a long winding corridor, or when they finally get you. It's how they try to get under your skin, and if that's even what they're trying to do. My birthday? Did you have a gift for me? Do they take pride in killing you, or is it bittersweet for them? But fitting. It also adds more to the supernatural element of these antagonists, kind of like when the animatronics would breathe in FNAF 1 and FNAF 4, but on a larger scale. Suddenly these antagonists have become actual characters, and that level of development for them would not have been possible without their newfound speech. And as you've probably noticed me reference a few times, some of FNAF's voice actors have been kind enough to come onto Dorco's own FNAF show, wherein he would interview people involved with FNAF, including the voice actors. Fun time Freddy! Go for it. This series started shortly after the release of Pizzeria Simulator, and continued long after the release of Ultimate Custom Night. It's provided a lot of insight into the behind the scenes of FNAF, and the work that goes into the voices of the characters. The way uh, FNAF auditions work is that, as soon as Scott posts them, you have about like 30 minutes to an hour to respond. Yeah. So everybody's just on crunch time, just trying to get those auditions in. The audition listing and the audition notice was for a cute little bunny. And I was like, oh, I know what a cute little bunny. This is what a cute little bunny sounds like, right? So I sent in that audition and Scott was like, I like it very much. But let's, uh, you know, let's, can we make it a little more, you know, evil? Like, can you bring it a little creepier? And I was like, yeah, sure. I can, I can bring it creepier, right? So it was, it was that. So yeah, that's, that's how I came up with the voice. And in some cases, most notably with PJ Haywood's interview, it's helped to solve a few mysteries, both in and out of the games. For example, people were still uncertain whether Cassette Man was actually Henry or not in FNAF 6, but on Haywood's episode of the FNAF show, he calls the character by name. There's one person I'm envious of, and I think that's, uh, I think, did the voice acting of uh, for Henry. Which the community took as the closest thing to an official confirmation, seeing as Hayward does play the most important characters in FNAF. That, and he's done this kind of thing before, listing Michael Afton as being one of his roles that he's performed on his online profile, before people were 100% sure this Michael character in Sister Location was really an Afton. It's me, Michael. This interview is also how we know the Sister Location opening was intended for a trailer. And then at the end, uh, the board member drops uh, Mr. Afton. Yes, and, yes. Uh, people lost their minds. Yes. So um, it was interesting that that entire sequence was originally was under the understanding it was it was for a trailer mm -hmm. and when the trailer was aborted i thought oh that's it's not going to appear but then it showed up at the beginning of sister location so i was very pleased becky shrimpton's interview also confirmed that she voiced the giggling from bonnet in sister locations custom night and that she didn't voice this line presumably from the mini arenas Tiffy with you did you do bonnet's giggle in custom night uh I did, it's just taken from my original stuff. So that is me doing that. <laughs> but then of course there's just like a filter put onto it and alteration. So yeah, that's me. Bonnet says, take me with you. Oh. Was that you? No, I didn't say that, that was not me. I can confirm that that was not in the lines I was given to read. Okay, Yeah. so it's not Bonnet then? It's not Bonnet, no. And then there's also the entirety of the Scott Cawthon interview, which is technically an episode of the FNAF show. But, but I'll tell you, he, he, he did a video on that box and he kind of said that he thinks the contents of the box changed over the years. You know, and I bet nobody gave that a whole lot of thought, but I, I saw that and I was like, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. The contents of that box have changed over the years. But Basically, through getting to hear from the people who had a hand in making FNAF the way it is, this web series has made a significant mark on the history of FNAF and its voice acting. And now, Ultimate Custom Night. Just look at this roster. 33 out of the 50 characters in this game have fully recorded voices, three of those being made up of recycled voice lines, and four more roles not visible on this select menu. And because there are so many, I'm going to go through this game in a lightning round. Chris McCullough, Foxy. Arr, I came for you, booty. Pig Patch. <laughs> Foxy was the first character of the original band to get an official voice with this game. McCullough actually expressed interest in playing Foxy in his interview with Dorco before UCN. I think you do a good Foxy. Yeah, I like that. I would do. I would. I would do. A, I would do Foxy. There you go. Darren Roebuck, Toy Freddy. That game was totally rigged. Amber Lee Connors, Toy Chica. <laughs> Connors tried to make Toy Chica sound slightly sexual to go along with the tone of her lines and also to make her feel more uncomfortable slash unsettling. I kind of like 
like try to like toe the line of like creepy and slightly sexual with her yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I I feel like that's like the most unsettling. Jenna Rundis, Mangle. Don't be afraid. The puppet. The others are like animals. What is it with FNAF voice actors and being able to do really convincing child voices? Darby Worley with a chica. <laughs> Hans Yunda with a bonnie. You Tim Simmons, Nightmare Freddy. I am remade. Zach Hoffman, Nightmare Fredbear. We know who our friends are. Eric Ward, Nightmare. You will not be saved. Some of, if not all of the voice lines in UCN are a part of just one take, seen best with Nightmare, as this performance is incredibly breathy, and you can hear the breaths between lines get cut off in the game compared to the original take. The shadow fears me. The shadow fears me. I am your wickedness. Keondra Shanae, Jacko Chica. Greetings from the fire. Alex Lee, Nightmare Eon. Let Teddy this performance came from Lee doing the deepest voice he could and adding a bunch of voice filters to get it to sound as far from human as possible. It's basically just, just like me doing the deepest voice I can do and then you just slapped, I don't know, actually a couple filters on there. When he posted it, it was make a character that doesn't sound like a human. I've seen claims that Night Marion's voice is composed of multiple different actors, but haven't found anything to verify this. Matthew Curtis, Nightmare BB. I'm closer. Music Man. Hey, the dog, would you? Curtis has uploaded videos of himself singing with these characters' voices. For what is a man? Okay, that's enough. Joe Gordet, Funtime Foxy. Encore! Rockstar Foxy. Yar, who touched me bird? Mr. Hippo. What was I saying? Some of Mr. Hippo's dialogue was ad-libbed by Gordet, such as the brief interjections and small tangents he goes on. Most of it was scripted and a, a handful of things I improvised, and I'm glad he kept the stuff that I improvised. Gwyneth Knight, Trash and the Gang. Hey, down here. When you boot up the game for the first time, this voice is the first thing you hear, tricking you into turning your volume up so it can be <laughs> Madison Brunella, Happy Frog. Ninja skills. August Sargenti, Ned Bear. Stranger Danger. Peter Baker, Orville Elephant. What did you think of my act? Kai Skrotsky, Rockstar Freddy. Please deposit five coins. Skrotsky based this voice partly on the circus of values from Bioshock. I believe Scott said he wants it to be like one of those children's crane games. And the first thing that came to my mind was the Bioshock power-up things where it's like, Welcome, welcome to the circus of value. value! George Osborne, Rockstar Bonnie. Ali Johnson, Rockstar Chica. That's right! Becky Shrimpton, Funtime Chica. Say cheese! Lena Hill, Lefty. It will be over soon. No, I don't know why Lefty and the puppet have different actors. Kellen Goff, Fred Bear. <laughs> Goff auditioned for Freddy Fazbear originally, but his takes were repurposed to be used for Fred Bear, as Scott wanted to hold off on giving Freddy a voice. I auditioned for Freddy Fazbear originally, but we couldn't really decide on a voice for him because Scott's right, he, he needed to be an iconic voice and it was an important one to him but he says i'm the closest that's ever come to filling those shoes but in the end he just repurposed the lines for fredbear it was a mystery for a short while who voiced fredbear as his lines were distorted and pitched down so drastically in the final game that they were almost unintelligible stephanie belinda quinn dd how unfortunate yun ho anime voiceover the subtitles for these cutscenes are not accurate to the dialogue that is actually being spoken the dead giveaway is when the voiceover mentions potato chips. Potato chips and finally, Tabitha Skeins, the one you should not have killed. Hey, while I'm at it, I'll briefly mention special delivery. Freddy Fazbear is on his way. This game reprised the roles of most, if not all, previous animatronics, giving them plenty of new lines. Characters speak in this game while you are looking around for them and after they kill you. There's nothing I want from you except your life. Get jump scared by bon bon. You can't catch me. OG Freddy Fazbear and Toy Bonnie also finally found their voices in Special Delivery. The actors of both of these characters have long been mysteries in the community, with Freddy's voice actor only recently being revealed to be Tim Simmons. That sure was fun. And Toy Bonnie's still being unknown. Aren't I just the shiniest? Whew. That probably didn't feel like a lightning round at all, huh? Anyway, comparing this many roles in UCN to the amount from the first game, or even the first few, really puts into perspective how far we've come. 
Voice acting and story beats being told through voice acting are a mainstay in FNAF now, and it used to be so rare. Voices in FNAF are just as common as they are in any other game series. The newer entries even have captions now. They look so alien in this franchise, like what? Freddy's saying words now? Pizzeria Simulator seemed to be when FNAF properly found its footing with how it was going to use voice acting. You may not recognize me at first, but I assure you, that's still me. Hi, William. Where voice lines are used to indicate gameplay mechanics, telegraphing animatronic movements, and also to provide exposition, lore, and guidance. I say this because this stylistic choice was continued in Ultimate Custom Night and Special Delivery, though it was foregone in the Steel Wool games in favour of more conventional utilisation of dialogue in video games, where characters speak during cutscenes, during gameplay to give the player hints towards what they should be doing, and the occasional flavour text. I personally feel in that sense FNAF lost some of its identity and more unique incorporation of voice lines, but this direction is still understandable given the genre of games that Steel Wool worked on were different to that of previous FNAF games, being VR and Free Roam respectively, where previous FNAF games were point and click. So I suppose this simply reinforces the fact that FNAF and its presentation is constantly evolving and experimenting. The FNAF movie is bringing this franchise to a level of performance and storytelling that it's never seen before with live action physical acting. So I think it's really cool to consider the evolution of this series in terms of its use of actors. Also apparently Kellen Goff and Andy Field have expressed interest in being in the FNAF movie, potentially as extras. No, I haven't heard anything about the movie, but me and me and Andy, the guy who plays Hand Unit, we want to be extras in it and we want to figure out how to do that. So Bloomhouse producers, if you're out there, <laughs> hi. So I'm going to take this opportunity to say please Blumhouse, please, if it's not too late. I mean it probably is, but just please give them a chance. I'm sure I could have gone way more in depth here, so I implore someone else out there to provide their own walkthrough of these voices, to do them justice because these actors and these characters deserve it. Thank you to everyone for all the comments and interactions with this channel after my last video. It's insane to me how much that blew up, and while the sudden amount of eyes on me is a little scary, I will try my best not to disappoint. Unless I already disappointed with this video, in which case, oops. That being said, please don't expect regular uploads, I don't think I could possibly keep something like that up. This video did take a long time to make, and mostly just to get right, so I can only hope it was worth the wait. I appreciate the support, let me know if there's ever anything I can do to improve, and thank you all for sticking around. Bye bye. Purple man's got a British voice!